Is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow. The As we turn to God's Word, we're finishing up the fourth chapter of John, and really to understand where we are at verse 43, 
we need to read the first three verses because the last two weeks as we have been uh, dealing with uh, the section on Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well and then he accepts their invitation to stay and uh, minister a couple more days in Samaria, that's kind of an interlude in this passage and then it comes back to the reason he was in Samaria is he was on his way to Galilee and ministry to be done there. So just to, I'm going to read those three verses so you kind of get the flow and we'll pick back up in this chapter. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So now he's been in Samaria, and it says in verse 43, picking up, after the two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. At Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed, and all his household This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been uh, an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now, that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, well, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him, and this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Amen. The call to worship that Reed read from Ephesians chapter 2 takes us to that place of God's grace and faith. In fact, the next two verses after what he read, 8 and 9, says, "For, For it is by grace that you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. We also read about uh, faith in, in the book of Hebrews. And there in Hebrews chapter 11, the first three verses, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith we believe that God is the creator. We believe in God, and we do all of that by faith. Sometimes that's questioned. Well, how can you do that by faith? And 
Part of it is an understanding that any faith is blind faith, but of course that is not the case. In 2012, over a thousand scientists had gathered, and not just any science. These were physicists, and particularly interested in the world of particle physics. And very quickly, I will not know what I'm talking about if I try to describe all that to you. These are brilliant scientists in this, in this study. And they had believed for over 50 years that there was a particle called the Higgs bogus or a boson, the Higgs boson particle. Never seen it, couldn't prove it existed, but it had been theorized for over 50 years. Well, they had a new toy to play with, the $10 billion larger uh, Hadron Collider. And for $10 billion, you can get some things done. And they were actually able to get closer on this and understanding this. This particle is so important to them, they call it the God particle. The New York Times had an article about it. Confirmation of the Higgs boson, or something very much like it, would constitute a rendezvous with destiny. It's a pretty big description for a generation of physicists who have believed in this bosom for a half a century without ever seeing it. There it is. These scientists have believed in something they have not seen uh, that has previously had been unproven, but it wasn't blind belief. Everything that they could see told them there had to be something like this going on. By the way, Higgs was a Scottish physicist. Not just to mention that. It's a, as Christians, we believe. In fact, in Hebrews 11, that explanation of faith says we believe that out of nothing God created all things. Why do we believe in God? Because all of the evidence tells us. Romans 1, the Apostle Paul says, the evidence is there before us that there is a God, that there is a creator. Can you prove it in a lab test? No. But that doesn't mean it's not true or that it's somehow irrational. Indeed, it's the most rational thing we could do is to accept the evidence of creation and then grace on top of that and believe. The official who has come from Capernaum is coming on the basis of evidence. So Capernaum's about 20 miles away from Cana. And no doubt he had heard about the water into wine uh, deal. So he knew Jesus' reputation. And he had heard other things about Jesus' power. So he has a son who is on his deathbed. And he makes his way to Jesus. And he comes on the basis of Jesus being able to do miracles. And Jesus responds to him, verse 48, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. You see, that kind of sounds brusque, but Jesus is not wanting to support or reinforce a faith that is dependent on signs and wonders. That was the signs and wonders. Well, John uses sign throughout, and always the sign is to say it's a sign. It's pointing. It's pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to his identity. It's a pointing to his power. It's, it's, it's pointing us to know him, that the glory would go not to the signs and wonders, but to the one behind the signs and wonders. That's the purpose of it. And so Jesus doesn't want this man to be caught up. He doesn't want faith to be based merely on signs and wonders, but on the one who does it and is able to do all things. So Jesus says this, and he responds, Sir, come down before my child dies. He's not at this point, and, and if you're a parent, you understand this. He's not wanting to, to discuss all the specifics and niceties of faith and what it is and what it isn't. He needs Jesus, and his son needs action. And action follows through in the form of a promise. We sang about the surety of God's promises in Christ. And Jesus says to him, verse 50, go, your son will live. And it says that he takes Jesus at his word. He believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went on his way. 
in Timothy Keller's book on prayer, he talks about how speech and action go together and that our words are not just conveying information, but our words actually accomplish something. But for our words to accomplish something, we have to do a deed along with our words for that to happen. And actually, our words can fail. So kind of like this, I don't know if you've ever, and I'm weird, so I'll just put it out front, but go to a dark room and you think, let there be light. But of course, if that's going to happen, I've got to turn on the light switch. I can't just decree it. And the house has to have been properly wired and everything for lights, and there needs to be bulbs in place. All of those props need to be there, but then the power is there to do that. You see, God doesn't need any other props in place. And when God speaks, it's as good as an action. When God makes a promise, it is as good as done. And when Jesus says, go, your son will live, the man believed Jesus and went on his way. Well, in fact, this was happening, and the servants of the household were on their way to meet him. They didn't want to wait for him to get back and just say, we'll surprise him. He'll be really surprised to see him doing well. They knew it was, it was too heart-wrenching for that. They had to go find him to tell him the good news. Of course, they have no idea about Jesus and what Jesus has done. They know he hadn't been there. But he says, can you tell me about what time that happened? And he realizes that uh, synchronous with what Jesus said was the recovery of his son. That means something uh, to us. In the process of faith, he comes to believe and he lays hold of that belief. And not only he believes, verse 53, but his household comes to believe. We see something about the meaning of faith here. Faith is a, a critical element, a crucial element in the, in the story. The boy has a desperate need. Jesus never is physically present with the boy. And that's helpful to us to know that. It's parallel to our situation, right? We don't have Jesus physically present with us in the room where we can see him and hear him and touch him. But that does not in any way limit his ability to minister to the needs of his people. And in fact, it creates the context in which faith operates. Faith isn't based on what we see. It's not based on the signs and wonders happening before us. J.C. Ryle says, we learn from this passage that Christ's word is as good as his presence. Jesus didn't come to Capernaum to, seek, uh, to see the sick young man, but spoke the word, your son lives. He spoke and the cure was done. When Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, he concludes it at the end of chapter 7 in Matthew. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is, will be like a man, a wise man, who built his house on a rock. And so when we lay hold of every word of God, we find ourselves with our feet firmly planted on rock. Biblical faith is not blind faith. When Jesus makes the declaration that your son lives, that's assured. When we read in John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, that's done. In John 6, verse 63, Jesus says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. It's done. We get a sense of the meaning of faith here. The story clarifies the nature of faith as well. Jesus here exposes the limit, the limit of merely of faith based on miracles and signs. And he just will not commit himself to those who respond only on the basis of miracles. You see, there's almost always another demand. There's almost always another test for Jesus. 
Well, Lord, if you will answer this prayer, then I will really believe. Lord, if you will, if you will give me this thing, if you will do this miracle, then you will really have me. And it can be good things. It can be things that we are to pray for. A life partner, a spouse, a, a employment opportunities, financial needs, healings. Grace for every situation in life. And God is gracious. He often even answers prayers like that, that are really pretty self-oriented. But faith that's based on signs and miracles must not be mistaken for true faith. And so Jesus does not encourage that because ultimately it fails to honor God as God. It treats God as like a kind of a divine genie. And God isn't the treasure. God is the means to the treasure. And the treasure is something other than God. It's what God's going to do for us this time. Jesus would not lead us in that way. Signs and wonders may well lead us to the point of hearing. But we seek the Lord who works the signs and wonders. And the glory that belongs to that God, to the Lord, that's signified by the signs and wonders. You see that, that difference there. That's the mark of, of true faith, laying hold of that. And then there's this element of the development of faith, and we, we don't want to miss that. The official himself moves, verse 48, from seeking Jesus out on the basis of signs and wonders to, in verse 50, taking Jesus at his word. It says that faith in the word of Jesus. He believed what Jesus said. But in verse 53, it says he has gone to believing in Jesus. He has faith in the person of Jesus Christ and indeed shares that with his entire family and they are blessed from it. And so this faith is a living thing. Your faith is a living thing. It grows, it, it develops, it's nurtured. And if it's not nurtured, it weakens, it wanes. Some of us, faith comes very quickly, even unexpectedly. Others, faith kind of grows over years and, and time as God works in us. But whenever and however faith comes to us in our own life, Faith is intended to be something that develops and grows. It needs to grow. This passage encourages us to see that. Indeed, the healing was not just for the boy, was it? What about that man? That healing of his spirit, that healing of his life, that, that, that change, that the reality of knowing Jesus for who he is brought blessing to his entire family. The treasure that we need it's Jesus himself. Nothing less can heal the deadly disease of the human heart in our generation or in any time. Then we come to chapter 5 and the healing of the lame man. And this is also something that took place at a specific place and time in, in history. And it unfolds there, the healing of this man. Archaeologists have actually uncovered the site uh, with this pool and the five colonnades that are described there, they can pinpoint where this happened. And it's just a reminder because there are other places that we can't pinpoint yet, but it's not because they aren't real, it's just we haven't pinpointed them yet. And it's a reminder when you read in the scriptures of Jesus and what he's done and where he's gone, that it's not legend, it's not myth, it's not allegory, it's history. It really happened in places and in times in this world. And Jesus comes to this pool. We're not told what draws him there. We're not told why he particularly uh, is drawn to this disabled man. There are many present. But the fact that he was drawn there speaks to God's compassion and mercy in Christ. Hurting people often feel overlooked. Hurting people often feel forgotten and sometimes like they're invisible. But the Lord Jesus Christ saw him 
I mean, he really saw him. And he sees hurting people, and they matter. He's compassionate. And this man has been dealing with an affliction for 38 years. It doesn't say he's been laying by the pool for 38 years. But he's been dealing with this affliction, and he's been there for some time. And this is one of those interesting places where John just tells us what the man believed. John is not saying that this is what God had prescribed and that he would periodically stir the water and whoever was the first one in got healed. But that is what they believed happened there. And so this man was waiting until Jesus, the healer, comes. And he asks him a question that's important. Do you want to be healed? See, when you've had a long, lingering affliction, when there are things that have happened from early in life, and all of us bear hurts or disappointments, but not all equally, and some of those things cast dark, deep shadows on life. And if we're going to be healed, it will mean some changes because it comes to define us in some ways. But the Lord wants to redefine us by his grace and mercy and compassion. Like the man, we can emotionally or relationally get paralyzed and stuck because of things. And, and if the Lord deals with that in our life, it will make us different. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to move to a new place in your life, in, in faith? And, and this man's reply is not particularly encouraging. It comes across a little bit as a complaint that, you know, there was nobody to get me to the pool. His understanding was it all revolved around this pool and getting there first. That cure meant one thing. It doesn't come across as faith that this man has. It comes across more as excuses about why he cannot be healed. Jesus' call to his people is a call to respond to him in obedience, in faith. It's something to think about. Are, are there areas in your life now that God is calling you to follow his call, to follow his direction, to follow his lead? And he's doing that through his word and through the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit in agreement with the word and also through the circumstances or providences of your life, all of those coming together. Is he calling you and, and are you doing so? Are you following him a step at a time with your eyes on Jesus? Or are you offering up some excuses about why, well, that really won't work for me at this time and this place and all the reasons. It will change you to follow him. Jesus extends his grace of healing to this man nonetheless. And don't miss that. Some people say, you know, the missing ingredient God wants, he's right there, he's at the cusp, he's going to do something, but you've got to come up with the faith to accept it. Where do you see that man coming up with the faith to accept it? He doesn't. Good news, beloved. Jesus is not waiting on you to have enough faith. The offer is made and the action is not dependent on this man's faith. He heals him and tells him, take up his bed and walk. There's the testimony. When God has done something in our life, we are to declare it. And Jesus tells him, take up your mat and walk. Everybody will notice. And boy, can people notice the wrong things. And drive you nuts listening to the news. Like, really? That's what you get out of what happened here? And so what they get out of it is, oh, he's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Not a man who has laid there 
unable to care for himself for 38 years, is walking. See, what they had done is turn the law of God, which is good, in this case, the law of the Sabbath. That's a good law that God has said, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Remember the Lord's day is the Lord's day. Put a priority on that. And in doing so, the, the people, it was kind of a protection for them and an ongoing reminder that their faith wouldn't be eroded away by the pagan worldviews in which they lived in the midst of it. Guess what? It's good for us too. As we gather on the Lord's day, it is a constant reminder and building in our life that our faith doesn't get eroded as we live in a world that's contrary so much. but they had turned the Sabbath into an end in itself. They had really begun to think that people were made for the Sabbath. But Jesus is explicit that the Sabbath was made for people, that the Sabbath was set apart that we might rest and refresh physically, emotionally, spiritually, that we would flourish as people. That's what the Sabbath is made for. And so God didn't give a hundred rules for the Sabbath day. But the oral traditions had added them on. Technically, this man actually wasn't violating the Sabbath, even in carrying his mat. He wasn't. But he was violating their rules. They lost sight of the ultimate purpose of the law. The law models for us a life which is pleasing to God a life that brings life, a life that said, I have set you apart by promise and made you my own, and you're going to live differently than others, that they will get a sense of what grace looks like. And so the Sabbath was a day of consecration. It was a day set apart. For them, it had become to mean idleness, but Jesus says, no, it means that I'm about the work that God has given me to do, not idleness, work. And look at the contrast. The Sabbath day had become a burden, a hardship for people. And they were trying to be idle. And Jesus says, I'm about the work God gave me to do, and I'm fully at rest. See, when we're doing what God calls us to do, we're at rest. And the Sabbath was made as that ongoing reminder. We neglect the Sabbath to our own detriment. Whenever we neglect God's grace to us, his gifts, it's to our detriment. Not out of punishment, but because we've ignored or neglected or misused the grace of God. They don't get it. They miss what God is doing. But apparently, even the man misses it. He doesn't know who did it, and that's fair enough. Jesus kind of retracted into the crowd. But Jesus looks him up in the temple, and he says, you're you're well. Repent of your sin so that nothing worse happens to you. Well, what could be worse than being paralyzed, basically, for 38 years? We have a soul that will never die. And we repent of our sin and we come to the Lord and we are set free. And we look forward to the eternal promises, eternal life. But apart from that, there is something worse that can happen to you. And it is eternal as we look to the Lord. This man had a temporal faith. A temporal faith is a faith that's good in a situation or a, uh, for a particular need uh, for, for uh, maybe finances or for a health situation or something else. It, it happens, and there may even be some bargaining in it. And, Lord, if you would do this, you know, I will be at church every Sunday. I will tithe 110%, whatever that means. We, we make promises, but in temporal faith, because it's temporal faith, it soon forgets. 
and it does not follow through on that gratitude. Jesus says, sin no more. It's not a threat. It's, just, it's a warning. It's a call to repent and follow the Lord. And it's a reminder that a return to health can be taken for granted. Ideally, it will propel us forward in our relationship with God out of gratitude and thanksgiving and that we will have a bigger heart to live for the glory of God. We will tell the story of God's grace to us as often as we can. This man doesn't have a lasting gratitude. In fact, once he finds out who it is, he goes and looks up the authorities. He doesn't say they found him. He looks for them and he tells them, the reason I'm a Sabbath breaker is because of Jesus. It's his fault. I mean, basically, that's what he says. God shares his gifts of grace with unworthy people. We don't have to do anything to earn his cure. If so, we would never receive the supreme gift of eternal life because we could never merit that. The glory of the, the gift, the glory of God's grace is it's for sinners. Not for saints, it's for sinners. It's for us. And this passage reminds us that God is for us. The Lord of the Sabbath is now accused of being the Sabbath breaker. And the authorities, verse 16, move to persecute him. Verse 18 says they move to kill him. But he says in verse 17, my father is working until now and I am working. Jesus is working even now. Jesus is at work whenever the word of God is read, when it's prayed through, when it's memorized, when it's studied, and when it's proclaimed, Jesus is at work. And we know that we are to respond to Jesus as the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of the universe, but will, how will we respond? Will we respond to Jesus in faith as he is leading us or will we respond with excuses, with our eyes on ourselves, or because we're needing yet another sign before we'll take another step? Or will we trust Jesus in all things? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that Jesus is a friend of sinners, that he doesn't wait for us to come around first or to garner enough faith we thank you that even when our faith can be kind of pitiable, the Lord meets us where we are. We thank you for your grace to us in Christ Jesus and that by faith we receive him and trust in him alone for our salvation as he's offered in the gospel. Lord, help us to follow you then and walk by faith by your grace to overcome our excuses and our doubts and our hesitancies, but to go where you lead, to do what you've called us to do and to be your people always, every day. Thank you for this Sabbath day to remind us that we are yours. Amen.
get the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts away, get the sound of Jesus' name. Oh, change will fall, precision. 